Thank you very much, Jeffrey. So, um, as the scientist in this project, uh, with such an extraordinary group of scholars, art, art historians, I'm bound to have to give you uh, ceramic technology one-on-one. -on -one. So you're gonna get uh, a little bit of priming on uh, how ceramic and porcelain is made so that you will be able to understand the variables that we looked at during our scientific analysis. So we can say that with porcelain, probably for the first and last time, Europe was trying to copy China. It seems to be the other way around these days. Um, and so to make this beautiful white gold, the hard white vitreous translucent porcelain body, in China, uh, artisans would mix kaolin clay with the china stone, petanze, that contains uh, quartz, mica, and feldspar. And they would get a mixture that fused together in a vitreous body containing kaolin, quartz, and feldspar in approximately two to one to one ratio. In Europe, lacking access to china stone, Botger, as, as uh, Meredith Chilton explained, was the first one to succeed in fusing together quartz and kaolin using uh, alabaster, using calcium sulfate as the flux. And uh, his paste was uh, continued to be used at Meissen well after his death. And so that we identify as Botker porcelain, um, calcium rich bodies that continued to be produced at Meissen until the 1730s. After that time, feldspar was used as a flux. And so we call Meissen porcelain a uh, feldspatic body. So when the, when the various ingredients were mixed uh, up together and the porcelain paste was of uh, good consistency, it would be pressed into the molds. And in this uh, uh, image from the Algarten factory uh, that was taken in 2004, you see pouring of the mixture. But indeed, at those times, it would be pressed into the molds. And uh, the, the mixture, the ingredients, uh, very much like cooking, would uh, actually affect the shrinking, the workability, the color of the porcelain body. And so here you see some of the pieces coming out of the molds, and you can see a little bit of the shrinkage here. And then it was time for firing. And uh, uh, what we call the biscuit firing, once the body was hard, it would be uh, subjected to the first firing, which was at about 750 to 1,000 degrees. And here I have various illustrations of ovens of the time, starting in, Ita in Italy in the 16th century uh, up to Vienna at the present time. And so what happens? Basically, you have the formation of a vitreous uh, a vitrification process where your sand, your quartz grains, you have them here, are partially vitrified and the clay and the feldspar form a crystalline matrix that contains what we call molite crystals. They are the hallmark of true porcelain and they create a very hard and shock resistance um, network for the porcelain. After this, it was the time for underglaze paint to be applied, and you see here some example of underglaze blue. And then the object could be dipped into an aqueous slurry that uh, formed the, um, clear, the clear glaze. And uh, the composition of the clear glaze, which was fired at much higher temperature, around 1300 degrees Celsius, uh, it's very similar to that of the bodies, but in different proportions. And you can see here in this marvelous detail that bubbles would form and sometimes could not escape from the vitrified mass. And so they give an opacity to, to the ancient glazes. And so here, this object in the Sullivan collection is ready with its clear glaze to be painted with overglaze enamels. And here you see uh, a piece in, in uh, um, the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago after uh, the color decoration is applied. And uh, for what concerns the descriptions of the, of the pigments, of the ceramic pigments, we don't, as scientists, as materials experts, we don't really make a difference between the materials that were used, as Meredith explained, directly to paint on the biscuit and the ones that were used on top of the clear glaze. We, we, they were all meant to fuse in the decoration. This is a difference from the uh, coal colors that were actually painted in oil over the surface of the porcelain and would be subject to abrasion and they would be much more delicate. 
Um, so you see here other examples from uh, the Our Garden factory, um, how the pigments would be uh, painted very delicately on the objects. And actually we find that all these overglazed enamels are uh, composed of leaded uh, glass, basically, because they needed to be fired, of course, at a lower temperature than the body, otherwise the body would crack. And in some microscopic details, you can see these this pigments. And the leaded glass contains either minerals or um, metals that are fritted in a glass and made into a very, very fine paste and then painted out in oil. And then during the firing, the oil would evaporate and it would leave this beautiful decoration on the surface. So um, just, again, a little schematic of the, of the different um, colors in the decoration. We have the body, the underglaze color, the, over, the clear glaze, and the overglaze enamels. And uh, in science these days, the buzzword is nanotechnology. And actually, in Vienna, uh, and even before, um, the artisans had discovered nanotechnology in making beautiful lusters, and you need nanostructured pigments in order to have the luminosity of the glaze. And so you've seen some of these images. Typically, scholarship on this beautiful object is uh, conducted through very serious and very rigorous observation and art historical um, interpretation. But this being the 21st century, we wanted to add a little element of technology to this study and take advantage of uh, new developments in X-ray analysis that have been uh, brought to the museum laboratories through uh, innovation in space exploration. And this instrument we've been using in the process is uh, in the process project is called X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. It's an elemental analyzer that uses X-rays. And you're all familiar with X-ray for medical use and probably also for analyzing paintings, for bringing to light hidden uh, paintings. So we're using a very high energetic portion of what we scientists call the electromagnetic spectrum. And here I have to give you at least one very technical slide because I really would like for you to understand what's happening when we examine this piece. Basically, the x-rays you see here, you've all taken some chemistry 101 at least. This is the representation. It's not the universe, but it's the representation of the atom. What happens, the x-rays penetrate the porcelain and interact with the elemental composition of it. And uh, different elements give off a certain fluorescence. It's like a fingerprint of the composition. And we can detect that in a graph and we can identify what the elements are. So uh, all this comes packaged in a very nifty, whoops, in a very nifty uh, small instrument that we could travel around with. And we were really fortunate to be generally hosted by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and by Paul and Melinda Sullivan and being able for the first time to um, go penetrate within the uh, porcelain themselves to uh, highlight their composition. Because as Meredith Shelton said, in this case, there are not very many surviving records of how these objects were made. And so the objects themselves become a primary record, a primary document of the technology of the time. So it's a little bit like CSI. And here it is. This is the daunting task of the scientists. We are presented with over 100 objects. And can we tell them apart? Can we say which, uh, which uh, Dupake groups they belong to, and which are Betsy's, and which are uh, Dutcher? And, and granted, we don't have the expertise that, that all the scholars uh, here have uh, brought to. So after over 1,000 measurements, um, we try to address this, uh, these questions. And, and basically how the influence of, uh, of this transfer of technology between Meissen and, and Vienna could be um, seen in the pieces themselves if the composition of the body was, was similar. And also whether even in the short time of the manufacturer we could see in their bodies an evolution of the composition that could help us date this piece. And, and also considering that there was even further uh, technology transfer and intrigue and travel to Italy and Venice and Florence, whether we could see reflected in some of those porcelain uh, the signatures that were developed uh, in the secret laboratories in, in, in Vienna. And then also, because of this gorgeous palette that we see on these pieces, uh, could there be an arcanum, could there be a secret to the Dupaque palette? 
So we started to look at the overglaze enamels first with uh, our uh, elemental analyzer. And uh, uh, we know from the art history that Vienna developed a full palette of colors uh, before Meissen. And we also wanted to see whether uh, the flight of Horus from Vienna to Meissen had some influence in the palette that we see at the two factories. And the palette of, of mice and overglaze and armor is much more uh, well studied and better known. And we already have some chronological hallmark that allow us to date the decoration based on this fingerprints, based on the color that we find on the surface and the elements that form them. And, and one of the main indicator is that after the discovery of chromium in 1802, much of the green glaze con uh, stopped being made out of copper pigments because clearly it was very difficult to make and, uh, and uh, they contain chromium. And similarly, we have the appearance of the element zinc in the blue color starting in the late 1700s and then in the yellows in the 19th century, an evolution from lead-based yellow to uh, vanadium and uranium containing yellows. So, um, as I said, in general, all the glazes on these species are um, low-firing lead silicate glazes, and they contain mixture of pigments. But we started really appreciating how the, um, the masters at Dupacchie had a great sensitivity and sensibility for color. So the yellows are mainly uh, painted with Naples yellow, it's a lead antimony yellow, and uh, they contain a tin oxide, a cassiterite opacifier. But uh, already the artists are playing with addition of iron to modulate the color. More iron would make a more rich and, and uh, um, dense color as you see here. And then we find something very unusual. In a number of pieces like this beautiful terrain, we see zinc in association with the yellow. Now, uh, as I said, with mycin, we typically associate the presence of zinc with later pieces. And in this case, um, zinc is particularly find, found in this very bright, luminous yellow. And so it sort of made us think as to whether there are relationship with this particular yellow and practices that were already known in Italy and documented in Maiolica production. Um, they are documented in the Piccolo Passo, the Tre Libri of the Potter's Heart, um, with a yellow called the Giallo dei Vasari. And uh, this yellow contained what uh, was named the Tuzia Alessandrina, a zinc oxide compound, and it said that it improved the optical properties of, of the yellow. And so um, we're very intrigued to see it here and to sort of start to see some of this uh, possible connection with, uh, with Italian uh, influences that might have come through uh, with uh, Christoph Conrad Hunger. Regarding the blues, not surprisingly, they're all based on cobalt blue. Uh, good, uh, an important source of this uh, cobalt mineral was uh, in what is now known as Germany, in the Elzgebirge Mountains. And, but again, we find um, a very wonderful combination of ingenuity and also resourcefulness in these artists because we find a lot of ancillary uh, elements connected to this cobalt. We find arsenic, we find nickel, we can find iron, we find potassium. And some of these elements are related to the roasting of the ore to make the pigments. But some others are additions that are made in order to correct the color. So we see in this, uh, in this uh, uh, elaborate um, dish here in the collection of the Met, there is an addition of potassium that was also uh, sometimes used at mycin to correct for a greenish cast of the hue. Uh, and then in, um, in some of the turquoise blue, there is a copper toning to, to give this more turquoise color. And then in some cases, we find high iron content. And this, to me, represents the fact that um, at Dupacchi probably supply came in small batches, and, and the quality of the supply was also a little bit uneven. And so the artists knew to mix up these different ingredients to correct for the tonality. Sometimes these this differences may be just related to where they were getting their materials, but 
to me, it's a wonderful example of this uh, ingenuity. And, and in line with what we find at Mycin, there is no zinc detected in this species because, as I said, zinc in the blues appears in Mycin after the 1760. And, and uh, we have heard from Meredith Chilton that at this point, the, the factory was no longer in Claudius Innocentius' hands. Um, the greens are a combination of copper greens, uh, Naples yellow and cobalt blue in different proportions to achieve different mixtures. Now I just want to draw your attention to this very transparent green from this armorial plate. And this is just obtained with a copper, copper um, mineral dispersed into the glaze. And you can see it's a very transparent green, but the range of Dupaque had bluish green, yellowish green, uh, and different kinds of greens. And so the artist started mixing these opaque pigments to be able to do layering and to be able to achieve this much more painterly style. And then in this uh, uh, saucer and beaker in the, our institute collection, uh, they use what we call a subtractive mixing. So there's no green pigment per se, but it's a mixture of yellow and blue, of the Naples yellow and the cobalt blue that gives the green color. Uh, moving on to the purples, uh, these were made with purple acacias, which is a precipitation of colloidal gold on tin chlorides. And you can see here again, even with just one pigment, they can achieve a wide variety of hues from a, a pinkish purple to a dark purple to a bluish purple. And uh, they would play with the gold content of the pigment to modulate the tonality. So you see, for example, in this example on a Turin from the Art Institute collection, uh, there is a very high gold content with respect to other pieces that we analyze to achieve this very transparent lavender uh, blue. And then another interesting clue that we got, but you see, we, we took a thousand spectra, but it's not enough. We should have taken more, because we see that, for example, with mycin, and mycin with the uh, purplish blues, there are cobalt addition. I mentioned that cobalt was used in the blue pigments. But we're finding that in Dupaque pieces, we're finding rather copper additions. Now, uh, scientists are a little bit like medical doctors. They want to see a big statistical database before drawing some big conclusions. And so I really would like to be able to look at more mice and pieces to see whether this is actually a relationship that holds true. Um, regarding the blacks, we have uh, heard a lot about Schwarz lot. And uh, it's very interesting because the blacks are a combination of copper and manganese and iron-based pigments. But for painterly scenes, uh, we find an addition of purple of cashews, probably to have some modulation uh, in a different style than with the hatched and engraved uh, uh, combination that, that Meredith also presented. And then in this uh, particular example, we haven't found purple acacias very much in blacks in mycin. And then there are these uh, uh, beakers and saucers, um, as all we also at the Art Institute, that are uh, painted by a house maler uh, on mycin body. And we do find these purple acacias. So we're wondering, this house maler in particular, the art historians tell us, that was working both uh, at Dupaque and mycin. So we're wondering whether he had seen this practice at Dupac and then transferred it to some of the mycin pieces he worked on. And then you see here the modulation of color. This is more of a brownish tone. This is more of a, of a dark black tone, so much so that we thought maybe this was a tarnished silver at the beginning when we looked at it. And instead, it's the artist just playing with the different thicknesses to achieve a different tone. So you see really the sophistication of the palette. And then moving on to the reds that were such a hallmark of, of Dupaque, we see in this case, this from a scientist's perspective was a little bit disappointing. It's all iron oxide based pigments. But here again, um, the modulation of the particle size and the firing temperature allow the artist to achieve all different colors of red. One would think that red is just one color, but indeed they, they do marvelous things with it. Um, and then with the browns, it was interesting for us to read that Stolzer introduced uh, a, pig, a mixture called Cappuccino Brown that was a combination of yellow and black. We haven't found this really in, in Dupaque, but in this um, object from the Metropolitan Museum collection, we found that the brown that is the the background glaze here, it's an optical brown contain, uh, obtained mixing uh, black and purple of caches. 
And then in closing with Gildin and Silvery, also with Gildin, Meredith Chilton so brilliantly illustrated the close collaboration between the goldsmith and, uh, and the artists at the Pake. And so they were able to make color out of gold. And so by modulating additions, for example, of copper to the gold, they get what it's called the red gold. And then they even do gold over ball, like in gilding of frames, for example, or, or uh, in other arts. And then what was most surprising for us was to find the so-called green gold, the gold powder that was mixed with silver to affect a more cool, a more cool tone. And sometimes, like you see, these two details are from the same, from the same object. So it's just mind-boggling the attention to detail and the technology, technological prowess of these artists. And with the silvering also, much of it is at this time tarnished. So when we do an elemental analysis, we do find sulfur and, and this sometimes affects the balance of, of the color in the, in, the, in the decoration. And again, this time in line with the, what we know of Meissen, uh, where uh, after the 1770s, bismuth was added as a flux in the gilding. We don't find bismuth at all in any of the gilded decoration of the packet. So moving on to the porcelain bodies. Um, here you have, in science talk, <laughs> an overview of all the different body compositions. So as I said at the beginning, the mixture of the paste is uh, um, clay and the kaolin clay with quartz and the flux that can be mainly calcium base of, or potassium base. And then there are some accessory component like iron and titanium that can give us an idea of the source of the, of the clay. So you see in this overview of the overall composition, things seem a little bit similar. But when we go in greater detail and we look at the minor component, you can start to appreciate here the lighter color is potassium. So you look at the Bodker, Bodker porcelain that I said is calcium flux, and the calcium contribution is much higher as compared to Meissen porcelain where the uh, potassium contribution is, is much higher. And then with Dupacke, we find different groupings and I'll illustrate them uh, in a few minutes. And Dupacke is more of a fluid evolution from the Bodker-like composition to the uh, uh, but n quite never achieving the true feldspathic porcelain that we identify with Meissen composition. And again, it's interesting, although we looked at just a few selected pieces of Betsy and Docha, to see that at Docha, um, the paste is really much more a feldspathic paste. So we don't see this transfer of knowledge from Vienna to, to the porcelain manufacturer of Riccardo Ginori. Uh, with Betsy, on the other hand, there is a much higher contribution of, of the calcium flux. So again, here we're presented with the question, can you divide these different beautiful objects in different groups? And, and here we have them. So these are the ones that tested, uh, like Botger porcelain. And here are a selection of the mycin, uh, potassium feldspar flux pieces. And these are the calcia flux uh, dupakin. And as I said, they have a composition that is very similar in recipe as Botker porcelain. There have been some previous accounts that uh, um, claim that it was very easy to differentiate one from the other. We have found that it's uh, sometimes easy when we look at the uh, minor components. So dupakin tend to have higher iron component. And in fact, when you look at the bodies, they are a little bit warmer. Than, than mycin, and also Dupacke uh, shows lower levels of aluminum compared to silicon, which means that the clay component was a little bit less than the quartz or the flint uh, component. And also this variability in the elemental composition indicates that they were getting their clays from different sources. It wasn't as precise as it was at mycin. So if we graph these different minor elements, you can see that there are quite distinctive groupings. Here are the Botker pieces, and here are the Dupacchia, the calcia flux. There are some cases, though, where there is ambiguity, and without the interaction and the collaboration with the connoisseurs and the art historians, the numbers only would not tell uh, one from the other. 
Uh, then, as I said, there are um, different subgroups that we differentiate because of the ratio of calcium versus potassium and the combination of, of the elements. And you'll see, we tried to find correlation with maybe the date of the pieces or the shape of the pieces, whether, for example, for sculptural groups, you would see a different body composition than, than for the uh, other pieces. But in fact, um, there is, uh, we think at this point, that many of the recipes, even the calcium flux, um, tastes that were more closely associated with Botger, although they are more um, uh, typical for earlier Dupaque, they continue throughout all the history of the manufacture. And also, if you look, this is uh, what we called uh, a mixed flux A. Here we have a teapot, and here's the lid. And it doesn't make sense that two pieces would uh, be made with different compositions. So it's really just the, the source of the clay that they were getting that would uh, give this small uh, difference. And, uh, and again, here, uh, the, what, we call group, whoops, what we call group C. And here again, we thought at the beginning that maybe the sculptures uh, could be um, identified with this particular pace, but a lot of the sculptures are um, attributed to later dates in the, in the production of the factory. And so uh, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg if it's, uh, if it's just coincidental that they all belong to this later group and they have this, uh, this composition. Um, so this study is very intriguing for us because we're highlighting the, the production technology of this factory that was unknown until this time. But actually can also be helpful at times. And so I want to present to you the story of this magnificent horse and rider that had puzzled our curator, Ganeta Zeleka, for many times, but down in her heart, she knew this was Vienna. But actually, the, the provenance and the attribution was a little bit controversial. So we did analyze the piece, and, uh, and here I recognize that it's much more enticing to look at this than to look at this, but we scientists get excited by graphs. And here it is, here it is the horse and rider grouping together with the Vienna production. Still, uh, from an iconographical point of view, uh, we've seen some beautiful ivories that were shown uh, earlier on today. Uh, this doesn't seem that your typical hand of a Dupaque uh, modular. And so uh, through scholarly research, um, it is now thought that the outstanding sculptural quality of this group could, and his, his high Baroque style, could have been a special, special commission. So this is one of the marvelous outcomes of this project where the materials tell a story and they are um, a source of inspiration for the scholars and the art historians to go and look for the true evidence for the real story behind what happened uh, that, that uh, sort of caused this horse and rider to, to group uh, together with the Vienna production. And here you have all the different groups here uh, coded in different colors. So here you have your Botger uh, production, and here you have the Calcia Flux Dupaque, and here you have the, all the different flux fluxes here of the Dupaque production. And what's interesting is that, as I said, although we were able to just examine a few pieces of Doccia and a few pieces of Betsy, here you see the Doccia uh, pieces lining much more with the Felspatic Mycin uh, production. And here you see the Betsy pieces that cluster more with the early Calcia flux um, uh, pieces. So this is maybe material for a new research project and for a new book. Uh, but in conclusion, <laughs> so um, what Botker porcelain we define as a calcium uh, flux porcelain, where there is four times more calcium than potassium, and mycin has up to nine times more potassium than calcium. Dupaque has intermediate levels. So we cannot really call Dupaque porcelain a feldspatic porcelain in, in our mind. And also, unlike mycin, we don't find this straightforward correlation with the chronology of the production and the materials that, that make up this, uh, these pieces. But certainly, there are differences in the production of Dupaque, in particular, the origin of the clay, and all, which is uh, reflected by some of these 
um, elements, the, the ratio of strontium to calcium and the ratio of iron to titanium, iron being much higher, that could be a hallmark of uh, Dupaque uh, production. And we think that, that definitely these inconsistencies were probably also due to the more serendipitous uh, um, getting of the, of the raw materials. Uh, certainly, we have demonstrated that the polychrome decoration, also from a technological point of view, was really the pinnacle of the time. It was so sophisticated, so rich. And uh, there are definitely similarities on the palette, but there are tantalizing clues, as for example, the inclusion of zinc in the yellows and the use of uh, purple acacias in the black that, that could indicate a particular style and a willingness to be even more uh, wide uh, in, their, in their palette, in their decoration. And so this concludes my talk. Certainly I would like to take uh, one more minute of your time to acknowledge Melinda and Paul Sullivan and their generosity and their hospitality to analyze their collection. Ms. Eloise Martin for uh, a generous gift of the instrument that allowed us to carry out all this research. Um, Meredith and Kenete, who are just wonderful, wonderful colleagues. It's been a pleasure to work with and for funding uh, the Art Institute, also the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Community Associates of the Art Institute of Chicago, but most of all, my colleague Annika Bezor, who you see here holding precious, precious prize, who unfortunately, she was instrumental in this project and unfortunately couldn't be with us today because she's holding another precious creature in her hand. And thank you very much.